Okay, thanks everyone for being with us this evening. My name is Julia Delara. I'm the Director of Development and Communications at Brooklyn Legal Services Corporation A. Uh, welcome to part two of the 2023 tax season series by Brooklyn Legal Services Corporation A and Grow Brooklyn. We are happy to have you with us. Um, as a reminder, this is part two of a three-part series. You can view part one on YouTube and you can register for the third part, which takes place next week um, using the same link you registered, used to register for this evening. Um, we are very grateful to our event sp sponsor and a uh, good friend, Senator Roxanne Prasad, for sponsoring this event series. Um, and I'm happy and grateful to introduce Chief of Staff to Senator Prasad's office, Taniqua Strong, to speak briefly. Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening on this Wednesday night. Um, it's raining, but it's a good night to um, be home and to hear a wealth of information on behalf of Senator Roxanne J. Prasad of the 19th Senatorial District. We welcome you to the Zoom web webinar hosted by Brooklyn Legal A uh, Services. I'm sorry, Brooklyn Legal Services Corporation A in collaboration with Grow Brooklyn. And so tonight is going to be a great night tackling taxes, which you're going to hear about tax credits and deductions. So it's a great time to hear about that definitely in this season, this tax season. Just a few things just want to bring to your attention on next week on Wednesday, March 6th, uh, we're hosting an event from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, in collaboration with NILAC, New York Legal Assistance Group, for free legal services to New Yorkers in need. And some of the issues... Um, if you need assistance regarding public benefits, identity death, disability business, debt management, custodian visitation, um, domestic violence, divorce, housing, if you're a tenant, healthcare business, consumer credit. So feel free to call our office. And I'm also, before I leave, I'm going to leave our the information for our office. But if you are available to jot it down right now, our number is 718 649 seven six five three and that is next wednesday march 6th from 10 a.m to 1 p.m and we just have one more of the event which is our easter egg hunt and we're we're expecting to be even more grandier than last year uh, where we get hundreds of children that come um, to participate in this event so on march 23rd from 11 at 11 a.m we'll be at canarsie park from 11 a.m to 2 p.m if you want to know any more uh more information please follow senator prasad if you haven't done so on Facebook and Instagram on Senator Roxanne Prasad. Thank you so much and you all have a great night. Thank you so much. And thank you again to you and the Senator's office for all your efforts, uh, your sponsorship of this series and for all your work to make tax services and legal services available to New Yorkers. Um, okay, so our presenters tonight will be Charles Healy, Senior Staff Attorney at Brooklyn Legal Services Corporation A, and Stephen Luke, Outreach Associate at Grow Brooklyn. Before we jump into the program, I'm going to turn it over briefly to Stephen to share a little bit more about Grow Brooklyn and the work they do. Uh, yes, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you're from. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, I'm Stephen Luke, Outreach Associate for Grow Brooklyn, a longtime tax preparer for the IRS VITA program, which is the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. Okay. Uh, a little brief history about Grow Brooklyn and the mission is Grow Brooklyn's mission is to enable community members to grow and preserve their assets, thereby securing their economic future. OK, this is what we do here. Um, we also to continue to foreclosure prevention. We work with attorneys and we have attorneys who can represent you in settlement conferences and negotiate a resolution. We have counselors who will negotiate for you, talk to your lenders, and give you budgeting and documentation advice. We have estate planning legal services, which is Go Brooklyn's Protect Your Treasure program. It's pro bono, which means free, end of life, and estate planning legal services. And we have the Black Homeowner Landlord Survey Project as well, a special project that we host. We have financial capabilities and housing counseling as well, which is free, one-on-one, -on -one, free, everything is free, okay? One-on-one, -on -one, financial counseling, which works towards specific goals, such as creating a sustainable budget, building, repairing credit history, establishing savings over time. We are all HUD certified, and we prepare individuals and families 
to be able to navigate the home buying process. To talk a little bit more about Grow Brooklyn, on this slide is the different sites and the different communities that we help and we give back to, okay? You, you can book appointments by phone, Tuesday to Friday, 12 p.m. to 8 p.m., and Saturday, 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. We have different interpreters, speak many different languages from English, Spanish, Russian, and Chinese Cantonese. Additional information about filing and the different free tax preparation programs and what we offer within it is we help single filers with incomes up to 59,000, filers with dependents with incomes up to 85,000, self-employed filers up to 35,000, and we have a special program for the self-employed people, okay? The self-employed hard workers, up to 250,000 in expenses as well. We service Bedford, Stuyvesant, Bensonhurst, Brownsville, Bushwick, Coney Island, Crown Heights, Cypress Hills, downtown Brooklyn, East Flatbush, East New York, Sunset Park, Williamsburg, and we also do drop-off and virtual preparation as well if you're unavailable and unable to come to the locations. Next slide, please. Thank you so much for that, Stephen. Um, Brooklyn Legal Services Corporation A is the other co-sponsor of this event. Brooklyn A believes all New Yorkers should have equal access to legal services to seek justice, make their voices heard, and overcome systemic racism and oppression. Established in 1968 as part of the war on poverty, Brooklyn A believes attorneys have a critical role to play in combating poverty, inequity, and racism. Our civil legal services organizing efforts and educational resources assist our clients and their communities in defending and mobilizing against harassment, displacement, and gentrification, and asserting their rights. We have three core program areas, preserving affordable housing, which includes eviction prevention, anti-harassment, seeking repairs and essential services, and tenant organizing. Our community and economic development program, which provides commercial lease assistance for small businesses and nonprofits, negotiates rent and arrears, and helps nonprofits with incorporation and startup services, particularly for the community nonprofits and organizations that are really essential for uh, low-income communities. Um, and finally, our consumer and economic advocacy program, which includes the low-income taxpayer clinic, from which we're, we're bringing you this series, and a variety of tax resources. That program also works on foreclosure prevention, deed theft, um, and preventing and uh, challenging predatory lending. And that program also houses our relatively new domestic violence support program, which offers services, including orders of protection, child custody support, and more to people seeking support um, from domestic violence. If you are in need of these or other services, please contact us, Brooklyn A. Uh, you can reach us at, by phone at 718-487-2300 or at info at bka.org. Um, so we're ready to get started with the event. Before we do, I want to remind everyone that we'll have a Q&A at the end of the program. You can type questions directly into the Q&A box you can see on your Zoom screen. Or once we get to the end and we've opened the floor for questions, you can use the hand raise button on your Zoom screen to let us know you would like to ask a question out loud. And then I will unmute your mic so you can do that. And with that, I will turn it back over to our uh, presenters and to Stephen to begin the program. Thank you so much. Okay, we like to talk about claiming tax deductions, okay? A tax deduction is a dollar amount the IRS, Internal Revenue Service, allows taxpayers to subtract from their AGI, adjusted gross income, to lower their taxable income. Next slide. A deduction, a difference between a standard or itemized deductions. A standard deduction for most taxpayers is a set dollar amount based on the taxpayer's filing status. An increased standard deduction is available to taxpayers who are age 65 or older or blind. Dependents. If you can be claimed as a dependent, you are still eligible for standard deductions. Taxpayers not eligible for standard deductions are married filing separately if the other spouse is itemizes. Married taxpayers who qualify to file as head of household may claim the standard deduction, even though their spouse filed 
as married filing separately and itemized. Since 2022, those who take the standard deduction may not take the above the line deduction for charitable donations. Line 12B has been eliminated. All right, here's a chart about the deductions, okay? On the left side, you see filing status. In the middle is the age if at the end of year 2023 you were, and the right is standard deductions for 2023. Okay, so the first section is the single or married filing separately. All right, you, under 65, your standard deduction is $15,700. Okay, for single 65 and over, your standard deduction for 2023 is $17,550. For married filing jointly, under 65 for both spouses, must be both spouses, okay, uh, under 65. Your standard deduction for 2023 is $29,200. For a married filing jointly, for one spouse 65 and over, your standard deduction for 2023 is $30,700. For married filing jointly, for both spouses have to be over 65, okay? 65 and over, okay? Your standard deduction for 2023 is $32,200. For a married filing separately return, 65 and over, your standard deduction for 2023 is $15,350. For head of household under 65, your standard deduction for 2023 is $22,650. For a head of household 65 and over, your standard deduction for 2023 is $24,500. For a qualifying widow, widower with a dependent child under 65 years old, your standard deduction for 2023 is $29,200. And a qualifying widow, widower with dependent child 65 and over, your standard deductions for 2023 is $30,700. Next slide, please. Itemized deductions, okay? We was talking about standard deductions and now we're talking about itemized deductions, okay? And itemized deductions include unreimbursed medical and dental expenses, including prescription drugs, health insurance premiums, including premium deducted from social security income, uh, transportation, 18 cents per miles driven during January to June and 22 cents for miles driven from July to December long-term care premiums for taxpayer spouse independence. Only that portion that exceeds 7.5% of AGI, adjusted gross income. Okay. State and local taxes, real estate taxes paid, limited to max $10,000 for married filing separately, $5,000, okay? Mortgage interest from your 1098 and a home equity loan, which is interest paid is deductible if the loan was used to buy, build, or make substantial improvements on the residence. More on itemized deductions. Points. Only points paid as a form of interest can be deducted on a Schedule A. Generally, points must be spread over the life of the mortgage. However, if the loan is used to buy or build a taxpayer's main home, the taxpayer may be able to deduct the entire amount in the year paid. Gifts to charity in cash or in kind, gambling losses to the extent of winnings, casualty and theft losses from a federally declared disaster, Form 4684, 4684. Refundable versus non-refundable, okay? These are credits. Both types of credits offer you the chance to lower the amount of taxes you owe. A refundable tax credit can also get you a tax refund when you don't owe any tax. Some taxpayers may find that non-refundable credits, deductions, or other circumstances leave them with zero taxes due. Even with no taxes owed, Taxpayers can still apply any refundable credits they qualify for and receive the amount of the credit or credits as a refund. 
consideration. If taxpayer ends up with no taxes due and the taxpayer qualifies for a $2,000 refundable tax credit, the taxpayers could receive the entire $2,000 as a refund. Amazing. Refundable tax credits are called refundable because if you qualify for a refundable credit and the amount of the credit is larger than the tax you owe, you receive a refund for the difference. Okay. If you owe $800 in taxes and qualify for a $1,000 refundable credit, you will receive a $200 refund, the difference, okay? What is a tax credit? Tax credits help reduce your actual tax liability, all right? Some common credits are, everybody may hear of the earned income tax credit, the child tax credit, so that's the EITC, CTC, okay? The child and dependent care credit and education credits, all right? All tax credits come with a set of qualifications that the taxpayer needs to meet in order to receive the credit, all right? Some common requirements include an income level within a certain range, family size, or a requirement that the taxpayer had some earned income. Earned Income Tax Credit, EITC, okay? Some people call the Earned Income Credit, okay? Tax credits reduce your actual tax liability. The Earned Income Tax Credit, EITC, is a refundable credit designed to help out low and middle income households. To qualify for the credit in 2022 and the 2023 tax year, a single father with no children must have an AGI below 16,480, while the cap for a married couple with three or more children is 59,187. Now, each year it may change depending on the tax laws because it change, it could be overnight, you never know. So always pay attention, go to irs.gov because they have the live updates, okay, for these numbers. So they may change, all right? The Earned Income Tax Credit, EITC, all right, is a refundable credit, refundable, get it back, okay, designed to help out low and middle income households. To qualify for the credit in the 2023 tax year, a single father with no children must have an AGI below $17,640, while the cap for a married couple with three or more children is $63,398, okay? You cannot claim the earned income credit, the EITC, if you have an investment income over $11,000 or if you're married, filing separately, that's MFS, okay? Depending on your income, your filing status and number of dependents, the credit could say, you could save in anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand dollars on taxes, okay? You can save that, all right? The EITC is an important benefit for working people with low to moderate incomes, okay? Low to moderate income, but you must file a federal tax return to get it even if you owe no income tax. So please file, file, file. We do it for free, please. <laughs> All right. So the AGI, which stands for your adjusted gross income limits for earned income tax credit, EITC. So on the left side, you see dependents claimed. In the middle is single head of house, excuse me, household or widowed. And on the right is married filing jointly, okay? Let's start with zero dependents claimed. You are either single, head of household, or widowed. All right, you get back $17,640. And if you have zero dependents claimed, married filing jointly is $24,210. For one dependent claim, single, head of household, or widowed, you get $46,560. And if you're a married filing jointly, you get $53,120. For two dependents claimed, single, head of household, or widowed, you get $52,918, and, uh, $52, and married filing jointly, $59,478. And for three or more dependents claimed, you get $56,838 if you're single, 
at a household or widow. And if you're married filing jointly, you get back $63,398. Married filing separately, MFS, okay? MFS does not qualify for the earned income tax credit, okay? It does not, all right? Next slide. Typical maximum EITC earned income tax credit amounts, okay? So on the left side, you see dependents claimed. On the right, you see amount, the maximum credits, okay? So for zero dependents claimed, the max amount of the credit you will get is $600. For one dependent claim, the maximum credit amount is $3,995. For two dependents claimed, the maximum credit amount is $6,604. And for three or more dependents claimed, the maximum credit amount is $7,430. Tax credit advice, why file? Okay. About one out of five eligible taxpayers either don't claim some credits on their tax returns or just don't file a tax return at all. Even if the individuals are not required to file a return, they should file to qualify for certain refunds. One, to get an earned income tax credit, EITC, if the taxpayer has earned income and qualifies for the earned income tax credit. Two, to get additional child tax credit or American Opportunity Credit. Three, to get back taxes withheld. Okay, and four, if you have to pay back excess premium tax credit, additional taxes, schedule two, line two, or claim net premium tax credit, additional credit, schedule three, line nine, under Affordable Care Act, ACA, you must have a 1095A. If no federal return is required, they may benefit by just filing a state return. Child tax credit. The child tax credit or the CTC lets you credit up to $2,000 per dependent child under the age of 17. The income limit is $400,000, all right, for mild, married, filing jointly, and $200,000 for all of the others. So, as you can see on the right side, is your Schedule 8812, which is the breakdown for the credits, all right? The CTC child tax credit is also partially refundable up to $1,500, okay? The child tax credit and credit for other dependents. The child tax credit, CTC, is a non-refundable credit. For tax year 2023, families claiming the child tax credit will receive up to $2,000 per qualifying child, all right? The eligibility, you must be under age 17 on December 31st of the tax year, a U.S. citizen, a U.S. national or resident of the United States, a dependent of taxpayer, a child, sibling, or descendant of either relationship criteria, okay? You provided less than 50% of their own support lived with the TP, the taxpayer, okay, for more than half the year and must have a SS number, which is your social security number, and there's special rules for divorced or separated parents. The child independent care credit. You can claim the credit even if you work from home and pay someone to care for your child, all right? If you have the care provider's name, address, and ID number, all right, you might be eligible for the credit, even if, if the taxpayer tried to obtain this and could not claim the credit. However, no e file and it may be disallowed. Okay, so there's no electronically filing that's what e file. All right, it may be disallowed, so you may not be able to send it if you don't have these specific numbers. Okay, the address and ID. All right, the credit ranges from 20% to 35% of the taxpayer's expenses. The percentage is based on the taxpayer's earned income and adjusted gross income, AGI, all right? The amount of the credit cannot be more than the amount of the income tax on a return. It can reduce an individual's tax liability to $0, all 
but it will not give the taxpayer a refund. Payments to relatives may, may, okay, qualify as work-related expenses if the taxpayer does not claim the relative as dependent. Not allowed, all right? It's not allowed if the taxpayer's child who is under age 19 at the end of the year, even if the child is not the taxpayer's dependent, okay? Tax breaks for education expenses and student debt. If you're a college student, a student's parent, a graduate with student loan debt, or an employee seeking further education in your field, you could qualify for one of these key tax breaks. Right? Let's begin with the American Opportunity Credit. It's good for up to four years of undergraduate higher education. Four years, all right? It can pay up to $2,500 for qualifying expenses for each qualifying student. And you may get up to 1,000 of that refundable, okay? The lifetime learning credit, which is worth up to $2,000 per year, but is non-refundable per tax return, not per student. It can be used for undergraduate expenses, graduate school, even professional or vocational courses. The student loan interest deduction. It helps cover the interest you pay on your student loans and can help reduce your taxable income by up to $2,500 and you could claim it even if you don't itemize deductions. And is not available if you are married and filing separately, okay? Planning for college for yourself or for a child? Look into the 529 plan. It's an education savings plan operated either by an educational institution or by the state. All right, there are two types. There's saving programs where the entire account can be used at an accredited college, university, or other school. And there's prepaid plans where the in-state tuition is paid in front. Initially, this type of plan was set up with a particular college or university in mind, okay? The Coverdell Education Savings Account. This account lets you set aside up to $2,000 per year for the beneficiary and can be used tax-free, not only for college, but from kindergarten to 12 expenses as well, all right? The student beneficiary must be under age 18 when the account is created but there are some limitations. The ESA half custodians, usually the financial institution where the account is located and a Coverdell ESA is considered a parent's asset by the financial aid system, just like the 529 savings plan, but it's unlikely you see any state tax breaks, unfortunately, for an ESA. IRS tax dates to remember. The tax deadline to file for on most Americans is Monday, April 15th, 2024, okay? These dates change as you can, like I said, go on irs.gov. They have the live updates because if it may fall on the weekend or a holiday, this date may change, okay? Okay, when is the deadline if I file for an extension? Taxpayers requesting an extension we have until October 15th, 2024 to file their 2022, 2023, 2024. Like I said, it, the dates will change depending on where it falls on it, within the calendar year, okay? Filing an extension doesn't push back your payment deadline though. Remember that it doesn't push back that what you have to pay. You still need to submit anything you owe on time to avoid late penalties. So the penalties will still accrue during this time, all right? An extension just gives you more time to complete your return, to file, you know, any information that you didn't. Sometimes your employer sends out certain forms late. So this gives you time to get everything together, all right? Tax-related identity theft recap. What is PII, all right, personally identifiable information, all right, is any information 
that can be used to authenticate your identity. This includes your SSN, which is social security numbers, passwords, tax ID numbers, credit or debit card numbers, date of birth, prior AGI, adjusted gross income, and so on. You can never be too careful about protecting your PII. Make sure that websites you share with your PI on it have security measures in place, like two-step verification and encryption certifications. All right, phishing and how to avoid it. Phishing is a tactic used by scammers to gain your personal information online. Scammers can use emails or websites to coerce victims into giving up their personal information by posing as friends, organizations, or government agencies. The goal is to nab any form of personally identifiable information. All right, so be careful. Your social media is anything. They can, you know, pose as somebody else just to get your information, all right? The IRS will never email you. If you ever receive an email claiming to be from the IRS that demands any PII, personally identifiable information, you can confidently ignore it, all right? Ignore it. It is not the Internal Revenue Service, all right? The IRS never initiates communication with taxpayers by email. And now I, I will pass this on to my colleagues at Brooklyn A. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I want to thank Senator Roxanne Persaud and um, also her chief of staff for attending tonight. Um, thank her office for sponsoring this event. Also, Grow Brooklyn and Mr. Stephen Luke for uh, what he just presented. Uh, all the useful, all that useful information. Um, some of what Mr. Luke uh, spoke about today, I'm also going to uh, try to link in to my presentation. Um, uh, some of the items, are, there's going to be some crossover. So um, my name is Charles Healy. I'm a staff attorney with Brooklyn Legal Services Corporation A. Um, I'm in the Consumer and Economic Advocacy Unit within BKA. We have a low-income taxpayer clinic, which is designed to assist taxpayers who have some kind of an IRS issue. Um, so we we don't typically do tax preparation. Uh, we would love for you to go to Grow Brooklyn, uh, have that done. And then if there's an issue that comes up after that, uh, for instance, a credit is denied or something, um, you can either work with them or uh, you could come to us for some assistance with that. The unit I'm in, we also have a foreclosure prevention um, unit, uh, so to speak. So we assist homeowners who are facing foreclosure. We represent our clients in state and federal courts, including the United States Tax Court and the Bankruptcy Court. So today what I'm going to be speaking about is targets of abuse who are claiming dependence. Um, so we can go to the next slide. The, the things I'm going to cover today are going to be, we're going to talk about dependence um, and how those are defined. So those came up in Mr. Luke's presentation. Um, I'm going to touch on those a little bit. Um, something called tiebreaker rules, which are the IRS's rules uh, for deciding who can actually claim a dependent if there's a contest between two people trying to claim the same dependent. Identity protection and identity theft, um, something that Mr. Luke just spoke about. I'll go into some stuff that you can do if you are a victim of identity theft. And something called innocent spouse relief, um, anticipating audits from the IRS or New York State, and uh, some additional tips just for filing and um, dealing with some of these some of these events if they occur. Uh, and then we'll both take your questions at the end. Okay, so um, what Mr. Luke went through a lot of was the filing status. Uh, so that's, you know, some of the terms you probably are familiar with are, you know, filing single, filing, married filing jointly, um, married filing separate, those types of things. Um, 
the dependence that you have on your tax return will play into your filing status. The, the dependents that you have on your return are also going to um, dictate what types of credits that you can claim. So Mr. Luke was talking about different credits you can claim. Now, whether you can have a dependent on your return or not is going to make a difference in what kind of credit you can get or how much uh, that credit would be for. So that's why this is um, important. Um, the... A lot of folks have a conception of what a dependent is and who they can put on their tax return. So part of what I want to emphasize here today is there, the rules for dependents are actually a little bit more complicated than what we might originally think. Um, some of the people in your life that you think you can have as a dependent on your return, you might they might not actually be allowed. And then other people who you might not have thought uh, you could pot potentially um, have them on your return. So just to give an overview, uh, making a determination as to whether or not somebody is a dependent, you're going to go through a two-step process. The first is you're going to determine if they're a qualifying child or a qualifying relative. And then after that, uh, if they can be taken to the next step of being called a dependent. So <clears throat> not to get into every single rule because there are there's actually quite a few. Um, the probably the easiest way to understand it would be going if you want additional information would be to go to um, the 1040 filing instructions. And then also, if you want to go even further, you could go into IRS publication 501. But definitely consult your tax preparer. Um, you just bring up, you know, here are some people in my life. Um, this is my you know son. He lives in another state. Can he be my dependent? Things like that. Those are the kinds of conversations you want to make sure you have with the person preparing your return. Um, so just to go over qualifying child, some of the important factors are going to be that person's relationship to you, um, their age, the um, where they live. Did they live with you for more than half the year? So part of doing part of making sure you get the maximum out of your tax return is having information like this ready to go for when you go get your taxes prepared or if you're doing it yourself. Um, then for a qualifying relative, some of the same factors, uh, their relationship to you, where they lived. Um, for them, it's going to also be your, their income and whether or not you provided um, uh, over half of their support for the year. So try to have that stuff ready to go if you can. Um, then the finding out whether or not a qualifying child or qualifying relative can be an actual dependent on the return. Um, you're going to be looking at things like their residency status, for instance, were they a U.S. citizen, U.S. national, resident alien, or resident of Canada or Mexico. Um, something else to consider is whether or not they were married. Um, if they're not married, it's more likely you can claim them as a dependent. If they are married, um, you still can in some circumstances, but you really got to have a look at the rules or have your preparer um, take a look with you. And then finally, <clears throat> if you yourself are a dependent on another person's tax return, you can't claim anyone else as a dependent on your own personal return. Um, so let's go into the tiebreaker rules. So this what this is uh, what I'm what we're talking about here are rules for when you have two distinct individuals that are trying to claim two or more trying to claim the same person as a dependent on their tax return. Um they could be the two people could be living in different households that's probably what it would be um, and not really in communication with each other or in agreement as to who's going to actually get to claim the dependent on the return. Um, so what happens when that occurs? Because um, just reading the rules uh, and, fo and following the rules, the, the both people might actually be eligible to claim that person. Um <clears throat> Excuse me. So what happens when that when that occurs? Who actually would win and prevail? Because a dependent can only be claimed once. Um, well, if there's a parent going for the claim uh, and then there's someone who's a non-parent, but who would otherwise be able to claim the child, 
or the other uh, the person doesn't necessarily have to be a child um the parent is going to win um when there's two parents and they're claiming them on separate returns uh it would be the child who lives with the parent the longest or I'm so the parent who had the child living with them the longest that that parent would win if the time was equal um I guess that's really in a situation where there's a leap year and there's an even number of days, but um, the the parent with the highest uh, adjusted gross income would be able to claim the child or the dependent on the tax return. Um, when there's a parent out there who could claim the dependent, but who doesn't, it would be the person with the highest adjusted gross income. Uh, and that's only if the adjusted gross income of that person is higher than the parent, than that of the parent. And when there's no parent who could claim a return and there's two separate um, filers attempting to claim a dependent, it would be the uh, filer with the highest adjusted gross income. Again, the idea here is not for um, the rules to be memorized. It's just to let you know that um, there are rules out there for determining these types of situations um, if you happen to um, be affected by this type of a circumstance. Um, okay, so we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> okay, so Mr. Luke uh, mentioned um, protecting your personally identifiable information uh, and being extremely careful with where you what that information kinds of websites that you um, enter that information into. If you do happen to be a victim of identity theft, um, there are some useful tools that you can use to um, mitigate the harm and reclaim um, your identity with the taxing authorities. Um, so I'll get into more of what I mean by that. The first thing that I want to talk about is something called the identity protection um, personal identification number or the IP pin or the, just the pin number. This is a number you can use, which is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's, it's a six digit number. It's unique to you. Um, and it's how you signal to the IRS that it's you who's actually filing the tax return. Then there's something that's called an identity theft affidavit. Um, which is something that you could file with New York State and the IRS um, if someone has been filing a tax return using your information. So I'll get into more about those. Um, the identity protection pin. Um, you actually do not need to already have been a victim of identity theft in order to obtain this uh, pin number. You, um, It's a number that's entered on the tax return, um, you'll see if you look at a 1040, there's a space with six boxes for you to enter the PIN number. If you're doing it electronically, the software should ask you whether or not you have a PIN number to enter, and then you would enter it at that time if you do. Um, you don't have to be a victim of identity theft, like I was saying, uh, but if you are one or you think you you will be one, then you would definitely want to get this number. So the way to obtain the number is to apply in one of three different ways. You would go online through the online services account, which I highly encourage anyone uh, here today to create if they haven't already. That in and of itself can be a bit of a process. You know, I would set aside a couple hours to set that up because you have to go through uploading documents and a face-to-face -face, um, phone interview type situation. It's not as bad as it sounds, but it does take some time and focus to get that done. But once you have it set up, you're in a lot better position to um, manage your, your returns going forward with the IRS. So you can apply on there. You can also apply via paper form 15227. You can also make an appointment with the Taxpayer Assistance Center. So the online tool is the preferred method, and they'll probably ask you if you tried that um, before they allow you to make an appointment with the Taxpayer Assistance Center. If you 
Mail in the paper form, the PIN number is going to be issued to you in December or January of every year. So now if you wanted to do it before you file, you would want to get it online. Um, once you are enrolled, you will be getting a new PIN number each year. So don't reuse the same PIN number last year that you're um, when you go ahead and file this year if you've already been enrolled. And you just get a new one going each year. So never use the same PIN number twice. Um, the Once you are enrolled, you're just going to keep getting PIN numbers every year to assist you with your filing. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. <clears throat> the identity theft affidavit is the tool you would use to alert the IRS and New York State that someone has been filing tax returns using your information. So why would somebody do that? Um, it's not, probably not because they wanna just go ahead and pay your taxes. It's more likely because they wanna take your refund um, or your stimulus checks if you're trying to recover stimulus checks from um, 2020, 2021. That was a, there, there were a lot of identity theft cases from people just trying to claim other people's stimulus checks and a lot of people missed out and are still trying to recover those checks. So the identity theft affidavit is a form, it's an actual form, uh, 14039. You can file it uh, online or a paper version with the IRS. And if you're going with, uh, if you're gonna file one with New York State, you would file it by fax or mail. And we'll go to the next slide. So it's good to file one with a professional if you can. We assist tax filers with this service. And the reason being is that if you're just doing it for the first time, first of all, you you might be overwhelmed by the form uh, because there's a lot of there's a lot of different rules set forth on the form about how you're supposed to fill it out. And there's just stuff that you might not know unless you have experience working with these forms. So uh, things I wanna talk about are, make sure when you fill out the form that you describe your circumstances with particularity and you wanna write out a narrative of what exactly happened that causes you to believe that you are a victim of identity theft. You're going to see on the forum, if you look at it, that there's about 100 words, a space for about 100 words. And that may or may not be enough for you to set forth your full narrative of what happened. By all means, type out the, the full narrative on a separate sheet of paper and just write in that box, please see attached um narrative or please see attached statement of facts as to what occurred and you can you can just basically write out everything you want to give the irs or new york state as much information about what happened as possible so they can quickly zero in on your issue and assist you as fast as possible you have to make sure you indicate what years were affected or else the irs is not going to know what where to look uh because it could go back, you know, 10 years, 20 years. Um, they have to know where to look and provide any documentation you have as much as possible. If you received a notice in the mail or if you receive or if you were sent an alert online, if you were filing your taxes online and the notice or the alert said, I'm sorry, we cannot accept or, you know, sorry, your return has been rejected because someone using the same social security number has already filed a return. If you see that, that's a major clue that somebody is abusing the tax system and using your information to probably try to take your refund. Um, it's a something you really want to address right away. So make sure you print off that sheet or print off that notice or save that uh, notice that was mailed to you and include that with your identity theft affidavit. Anything you have like that, which is proof, is going to really benefit you in making this claim. Okay, uh, next slide. 
So when you file the identity theft affidavit, there's some things you want to consider. First of all, it takes a long time for this to be processed. It's up to 480 days, which is more than a year. During this time period, the account, especially for that particular tax year, is going to be frozen. And there's not going to be any processing of any returns uh, for that year. And there's not going to be any refunds sent out for that year or any additional refunds until they are done with their identity theft review. So it's something you have to keep in mind if you were expecting a refund, you are you may now have to wait for them to go and fully process this, which is unfortunate. It's a another price that victims have to pay, um, but it's, it's just part of the process. That it, And so if the more documentation and the more specific you are on your ID theft affidavit, the quicker this could be resolved. It might not take 480 days. It might only take a couple months. Um, your account is also going to be flagged for the next three years, which is actually a good thing. It means that additional scrutiny is going to be applied to your account and the re to the review of the returns that are submitted in the future. So that's actually a good thing. It'll help the IRS be sure that it's actually you submitting the return. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> okay, what happens if a spouse or ex-spouse has committed misconduct on a tax return and um, now you're responsible for paying it? Well, there's something called innocent spouse relief uh, to help you avoid having to pay taxes that you shouldn't have to pay because your spouse was um, filing a tax return inappropriately. The The idea here to keep in mind is that when there is a married couple and they file a tax return, they're both what's called jointly and severally li liable for the tax. So if one, one of the spouses made $150,000 during the year and the other spouse did not make any money during the entire year, but they filed a joint return, both of those individuals are going to be liable for the tax on that $150,000. Even if they're separated after that year, they're still going to be liable for that tax if it hasn't been paid. So that's what this relief is designed to assist with. If you have a spouse who, for instance, left income off the return and now um, basically they committed misconduct. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, but they basically committed misconduct and now you're wrongfully associated with that tax. Um, so we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so this applies to jointly filed returns and the there was understated tax on the return attributable to a spouse's taxable income or taxable transactions. So I just want to try to paint again the picture that we're kind of looking at here. It would be a spouse who, the spouse committing the misconduct would, would have been one where he or she had unreported income that they left off the return. So for instance, they had a side gig and they said to themselves, I'm not going to report that income because I don't want to pay tax on it. So they just didn't put it on the return. They incorrectly claim credits or deductions on the return, or they falsely reported asset values following the purchase or sale of that asset. So they manipulated the price, um, the way they reported the price in order to avoid having to pay capital gains tax, for instance. The if that happened and you as a victim were not aware of it, you could be entitled to this relief. However, the IRS is going to pay attention to whether or not you did have knowledge and awareness of that misconduct. So they have the actual knowledge test and the reasonable person test. So the actual knowledge test is you knew that the spouse received the un unreported income. So if you knew about that spouse's side hustle or side gig, 
and um, that they, they didn't put it on their on the return that you filed together and you were well aware of that you're not going to get this you're not as likely to get this relief unless you meet the exception i'm going to talk about a little bit later um or if you knew the facts that made a, dedu a deduction or credit unallowable or you knew that your spouse deducted false or inflated expenses. These are direct from the IRS's website. So they're telling you, if you knew about these things, you're not gonna get this relief. Um, and if you were what's called a reasonable person and you were in, um, if a reasonable person in similar circumstances would have known about, the, uh, about these errors or the misconduct, then you would also not be eligible for this relief. So these are facts that you want to speak with someone, for instance, at our office, um, a tax professional assisting you about how these might or might not apply to you. And if you could provide any information or documentation that would, you know, counteract these tests. And we'll go to the next slide. So <clears throat> the IRS is also understanding that if you did know about the misconduct, for instance, you did know that your spouse made a lot of extra income that they didn't include on the tax return, they understand that there are situations where you might not have done anything about it because you couldn't do anything about it. So if you were the victim of spousal abuse or domestic violence before signing the return, if you didn't challenge the items on the return because of fear, or if you signed the joint return because you were pressured or threatened, those are going to be factors the IRS will consider, and you might still get this relief if, if those are applicable to you. Next slide. There's a specific form to get this relief. With the IRS, it's 8857. With New York State, it's IT 285. And just like with identity theft, you're wanting to provide as much documentation as you can to assert that you should be entitled to this relief. All right. <clears throat> okay. Now, there are circumstances where you file a tax return, you've properly claimed you're dependent on the return. However, the IRS is, or New York State is challenging whether or not you should be entitled to claim that dependent and the associated credits or filing status. This is <clears throat> a situation where you really wanna be prepared for it um, if you can. The ways to be prepared for it are just consider that it could very well happen to you. And you will, with that in mind, retain documents in order to prove the various items on your return. So your income, just hold on to your W-2s or 1099s or any other documentation that you have to prove your income for the year and the source from which you receive that income. The other thing, that's usually not as hard uh, for taxpayers. Some of the things that we're gonna get, that I'm getting to now are things that the sooner you start working on it, the easier it's gonna be for you to comply with one of these audits or requests for additional documentation. The residence um, of your dependents. So where your dependent lived is a factor in determining whether or not they can actually be a dependent on your return or, and you can claim credits. So if you have a lease with your child's name on it or school records that have your address on it, that you wanna try to save those in a safe spot where you can easily access them and produce them uh, as soon as possible if necessary. The If you're signing up for a new lease, um, you would maybe review that and see if there's a spot for your children's names uh, and try to put that on there so you can down the line prove that they did in fact live with you during the year in question. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then also try to hold on to, if you can, utility bills, uh, rent receipts, food bills. I mean, most people don't save that stuff, but if you can try to do it, 
because for head of household status, for instance, you would need to prove that you basically maintain the household. Um, and having these types of documents handy is just a great way to let the IRS know that you are entitled to these credits. Birth certificate to prove relationship. If there is a court order or stipulation stating that you are the one of the two parents who is entitled to um, custody of the children, that would be great proof uh, that you're entitled to claim them on your tax return as a dependent. So try to save these documents um, and try to make electronic copies of them. This would be scanning them in a computer through a scanner. You can go to a library. Most libraries have a scanner or Kinko's, places like that, um, any like office supply store. If you're going to take photos, try to use one of the scan apps like Adobe Scan or DocuSign. This is instead of just taking a regular picture, like taking a selfie, um, because that is a hard, the, it's hard to give that, it's hard to like send that out to the IRS. That's just something I would just encourage you to do is try to get good quality scans of the documents that you're going to use to support um, your claim to the dependents and the credits. And as I was mentioning, just try to anticipate that you might be challenged on the items on your on your tax return. So try to get these documents ahead of time. And the most important thing really too is to, if you get a notice that says that you're being audited, there please just present that to someone. You can present it to someone at Grow Brooklyn. You can present it to someone at our office or an office similar because there's probably a deadline on there. And if you don't respond by the deadline, you might miss out on certain rights that you would otherwise have. For instance, bringing your case in United States tax court, there's there's oftentimes a deadline listed on the um, notice. And if you miss that deadline, their federal law is that you just wouldn't be able to bring a case in US tax court to challenge the IRS on your ability to claim the credit or the dependent in question. And I think we can go to the next slide. Okay, so I just wanna close out here with some additional tips um, that really relate to everything that we've both been discussing uh, during the presentation today. The first one is to file as soon as possible. So if you, I put this on here because some people are looking out for an IP pin, the that six digit number they um, haven't filed their taxes yet because they're waiting for that in the mail or they just can't um, get through the verification process online. Don't wait, just file your tax return if you have all the information you need, all the other information, just file it anyway. And that's really the best way just to get ahead, especially of another person who might be filing and trying to claim the same dependent on the return you would want to beat that person in the race so to speak uh to to file that return because it's a lot harder to basically have the irs issue a refund for in association with a dependent if another person has already claimed that dependent and you want to have instead of having your refund mailed out to you, please try to have that direct deposited into your own bank account. Don't have it deposited into a bank account that you're sharing with another person that you're really not on good terms with. Looking out for potential ID theft would be, um, you can obtain an annual credit report. You can do this three times a year. It's free and it shows you all your open accounts with credit cards and closed past accounts with credit cards and banks, other financial institutions. If you notice any open or closed accounts on that report that you don't recognize, it's a tip off that you may be the victim of identity theft and you might want to look into taking the other steps, such as the PIN number and the ID theft affidavit. And there are also services out there that can help you protect your credit, uh, such as LifeLock. If you move 
physically move your address, uh, make sure to keep the IRS updated so you're getting all the notices that might relate to your tax filings and also set up mail forwarding with the United States Postal Service. So um, if the IRS doesn't get your update in time, at least you'll get forwarded those notices. So I hope this information was useful for you tonight. We at Brooklyn Legal Services Corporation A do have a domestic violence cl uh, clinic. So if you are the victim of domestic violence, um, please give us a call, 718-487-2300. And we have people who are ready to help you. Uh, we have a low income taxpayer clinic. <clears throat> if you wanna get your taxes prepared, I would refer you to Grow Brooklyn. Um, if for some reason it's not convenient to go there, you can also look up other free tax services. It's called the VITA Clinic Network, which is Volunteer Income Tax Assistance. So if you just type VITA in Google or on the IRS's website, you're going to find a way to get your taxes prepared for free uh, if you qualify. Most, A lot of people qualify, even though they don't know. So I don't like to see other people... <laughs> Sometimes we have clients who they could have gone to one of those, but they tell me that their preparer charge them like 600 bucks to prepare their tax returns. And I just wish they would have given one of us a call. We could <laughs> help set them up with free tax prep. Um, but I think we're ready for your questions now, if you have any questions. Mm. We had two questions in the in the Q and A uh, module. While maybe people are thinking, um, one of them is: Is there a penalty <clears throat> for not having health insurance when filing taxes? No, that's an old requirement. Um, the IRS, when you file, the IRS will ask you whether or not you purchased health insurance on the open marketplace. And then you would just indicate yes or no. There's no penalty for not having that. And another question from earlier in the program, but probably valuable for everyone is a uh, refresh on some examples of the refundable tax credits that are available to taxpayers. Um, some examples of the refundable tax credits are in the EITC, which will cover the earned income tax credit. You have the child tax credit, which is partially refundable. The American Opportunity Tax Credit, which is also partially refundable, and the premium tax credit. Yes, thank you. That is... Luke knows all the credits. Um, or Mr. Luke, I'm sorry, <laughs> Stephen. Um the one thing I just want to make sure to mention, recovery rebate credit is it's getting to be um, almost past the deadline for stimulus checks one and two. Mm -hmm. So if you miss stimulus checks one and two, um, you really want to talk with your tax preparer about how you could claim those because you'd have to file a tax return for 2020 and claim the recovery rebate credit, which is an example of a refundable credit. And then for 2021, there was one stimulus check associated with that tax year, you would, the same thing, recovery rebate credit. Um, or if you missed, they were sending out advanced child tax credits. So it was $250 or $300 each month from July through December of 2021. So if you missed any of those payments, you can still claim them, but you have to file a tax return um, to get it. It's called the advanced child tax credit. Great. Um, another question uh, in the chat, is a person eligible for a standard deduction if they move to the United States in the middle of the year and uh, passed a green card or I guess obtained a green card? Um, I would say it depends on the situations. You have to you know, look into really like, you know, how, you know, like I said, how long they've been here, they're working, you know, the work history, if they're going to choose to itemize, then it may be better for them to itemize. It, it all depends. So every situation is different. So I would say once you sit down with, you know, come to us like a free tax preparation site, we can sit down and find the best refund for you. 
what's the and what's the best credits and best way to go about it, whether you, you should have the standard deduction or them itemized because it depends on your dependents and you know there's a lot that may go into it. So you know, as long as somebody sits there with you and go through it, you'll you'll get the best best answer. Good, thank you. Um, and another question from the chat. I'm receiving money from renting an apartment with a city program. How can I offset taxes during the year? Um, well, if you want to answer that, oh, Charles. Sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, so that is a question where there might be more involved in that than um, yeah. that might be a more involved question. Um, it might even be a business income tax question. Mm -hmm. So we really do personal income tax. Um, and if it were a business income tax question, we might refer you to another uh, tax preparation organization or um, service. But if you do want to give us a call or contact us, we can look into that question further. Uh, send us an email at info at bka.org or you can call us 718-487-2300. And um, if you speak with someone or when you speak with someone there, you would just say you have a tax question and you'd like to set up an intake interview and we'd be glad to talk with you about that. Great. And you can see the contact information for Brooklyn A that Charles just mentioned, as well as the contact info for Grow Brooklyn um, on the screen now. Um, and those numbers again are for Brooklyn A, 718-487-2300, and for Grow Brooklyn, 347-682-5606. And there's email contacts there as well. That's better. Um, and then I'll, I think I see one more question, um, and then maybe we'll close. I'll say, um, do you have to have earned income when claiming my, claiming for stimulus fund money on a return? No. If you're claiming the stimulus checks one through three, there were three total stimulus checks. First two checks are associated with 2020, even though they might not have actually been issued in 2020. Um, and then there's a third one, which is associated with the tax year 2021. You, if you don't have to have income to get those checks. That's, that's correct, Mr. Charles. There's no minimum earning requirement. You're fine. Great. And then one more question. Um, can English courses be deducted as an education expense if they are part of improving communication for your for your work? Yes, as long as it's like you said, if you're if you're taking a course within, let's say, an accredited college that may for, fall into the four year program, which is then you get the American Opportunity Credit. But if it's, if you're not in a credit college, a full time student, or whatever, you're just taking courses on the side that could fall into the lifetime learning credit. Okay. Very good to know. Right. Well, thank you all for being with us this evening and for all your questions. Um, please feel free to follow up with the contact information if you have further questions or would like a copy of this materials. As a reminder, the third and final part of our 2022 series is same time next week, and you can register using the same link. And um, thank you for being with us tonight.